I'm reading from Rays of the One Light. These are Bible and Bhagavad Gita commentaries based on the thank you, based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda and written by Swami Kriyananda. This week's topic is entitled Is God Present Even There Where There Is Ignorance? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The Gospel of St. John makes a reference to the divine light that is obscure to the rational faculty, but that enlightens our higher nature. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Reason recoils from this statement with innumerable questions. What is this darkness? Is it conscious that it should comprehend anything? What sort of light would be capable of shining in darkness without transforming at least that part of it in which it shines into light? Does this light shine only at night? And if so, why only then? The solution is that to divine sight, even daylight seems like darkness. The sun itself, like the moon which shines only by reflected light from the sun, is but a kind of reflection of the cosmic light, which being immaterial, is invisible to the eyes, but which is the great source of all material reality. In Autobiography of a Yogi, Yogananda describes his youthful visit to Ram Gopal Muzumdar the sleepless saint who lived in the vision of that hidden light. Around midnight, Yogananda wrote, Ram Gopal fell into silence, and I lay down on my blankets to sleep. Closing my eyes, I saw flashes of lightning. The vast space within me was a chamber of molten light. I opened my eyes and observed the same dancing radiance everywhere. The room became a part of the infinite vault, which I beheld with interior vision. (coughs) Why don't you go to sleep, the saint asked. Sir, I said, how can I sleep in the presence of lightning, blazing whether my eyes are shut or open? You are blessed to have this experience. The spiritual radiations are not easily seen. The saint added a few words of affection. This is the light that shineth in darkness. It has been described variously in the great scriptures. In the Bhagavad Gita, the devotee, Arjuna, is given an experience of the infinite state and exclaims in awe. If there should rise suddenly within the skies sunburst of a thousand suns, flooding earth with beams undeemed of, then might that Holy One's majesty and radiance dreamed of. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. When I read this chapter, I was reminded of a story that Yogananda's younger brother, Sananda, tells in the book, Mejda. And Makunda was a, a, a teenager, probably early teenager, when this story took place. And Sananda was a little boy. And they were walking with their friend, Surenda. And this was on the streets of Calcutta. And they walked on the street, and they came across a huge pile of rotting rice. And the stench was so awful that a cow that had been walking towards them got a whiff of it and walked to the other side of the street. And passers-by were exclaiming, and, and the boys 
took out their handkerchiefs and held it over their faces, but it was just this putrid smell. And so Saranda and, and Sananda said, Makunda, let, that was Yogananda's boyhood name, Makunda, let's cross the street. Let's get away from this rotting smell. And Sananda said, Yogananda just looked at them, and he had this very distant look in his eyes. He, his mind was very withdrawn. He didn't say anything. He just kept walking nonchalantly as though nothing was going on. And the boys finally said, Akunda, let's cross the street. This maggoty rice is filled, covered with flies, and the flies are getting all over us. Even the cow knew to cross the street. <laughs> and Makunda said, the cow cannot comprehend that everything is made from God's light. Even the offensive rotting rice, it's still all God's light. But I know this. And so I could eat some of this putrid rice, and I would not be harmed because I know that God is there too. Well, Saranda jeered at Yogananda and very confidently said, well, if you could eat it, I could eat it. And Yogananda, he, I mean, Saranda thought he was confident that Yogananda would never do anything that drastic. But Yogananda just scooped it up and took a whole handful and savored it like it was a delicacy made with sugar and cream. And Saranda looked like he'd seen a ghost and he ran away. But Yogananda was a fast runner and he scooped up another scoop of this rice and he chased down Saranda and he crammed it in his mouth. And Saranda, as you can imagine, lost not only the rice but his breakfast and everything else. And then he seemed to be suffocating because he couldn't catch his breath and he fell down on the ground. And Sananda, being a little boy, thought, oh my God, he's not going to recover and the police are going to catch us. But Yogananda just rubbed Saranda on the chest, smiling the whole time. And in a moment or two, Saranda got up, fully recovered, naturally, after that kind of treatment, and said, I admit defeat. I will never challenge you. I'll think a hundred times before I challenge you ever again. But what Yogananda did, and <clears throat> Sananda said he never suffered any ill effect from having eaten that rice. But what he said was that Yogananda was beyond sense perceptions at that point. He perceived everything as light. Everything was shining with God. And so he could eat that and not feel anything. Maybe he didn't even taste it. Who knows? It was just so beyond sensory perceptions. And as an aside, that is not quite that drastic, but sadhus, spiritual aspirants, sometimes will mix incompatible foods together, sour and sweet and salty and you know rice pudding and and curry and everything, mix it all together, add a lot of salt and sugar, so they, it's just a mess. And they will eat that to try to train themselves not to have likes or dislikes in food. And Yogananda had practiced that a little bit. But seeing everything as light, Another time, many decades later, Yogananda was sitting with a group of monks looking out over the ocean, and he said to them, 
I perceive you all as light. You have no idea how beautiful everything is. So that's what we want to get to. That's where we need to aspire to see everything as God's light. The world right now is, is so polarized. There's so much hatred. Sometimes I think it's like rival football teams, and they're just, except it's way more than football could ever be. It's just so fractious, so much hatred. But we know the truth because we have been given the opportunity to understand these teachings, to learn these teachings. And it's not just us, us four no more. It's not like we have the only ticket out. We have the ticket out. And there are many true paths in this world, but we have been given the opportunity to study teachings that we know are true. They've been tested for millennia. And I was thinking about it this morning, how we have all this technology, and we have cars and planes, and we can zoom around the planet. We can talk to somebody on the other side of the planet. We have all this opportunity, and yet, Everything is the same as it's always been. Greed, jealousy, hatred, accumulating more and more possessions. Now it can get really out of hand, but material possessions have always been such a temptation for people emotional problems, dealing with death, dealing with grief, dealing with overexcitement. All those emotions have not changed. Everything is still the same. It's just clouded by television, radio, all these extra commotion devices that we have in our lives. But what we can do is to simplify. Swami Kriyananda also had, he had a house in Ananda village. He had a house in Assisi, so you could go, oh, he had two houses. Well, he even had three. Eventually had one in India, too. But no matter what his possessions he felt nothing belonged to him. It was only God. And in all of his houses, he shared continuously, always having people there, satsangs, dinners, always sharing, always giving. And in fact, everything was in Ananda's name. It was never any personal possession of his. And yet he traveled. He did all these things. There was no attachment. And that's what we can do too. No attachment. And seeing it all as belonging to God. We are stewards of everything we own. And eventually, we have to give it all back. Nothing is ours to keep except consciousness that we create. So let us be tolerant of everyone. Ananda Moy Ma had a beautiful saying. She would say, it's a form of intolerance to be intolerant of other people's intolerance. <laughs> and she had another saying that I really love too. She said, whatever happens, it's all right. Live in that calmness. 
in that centeredness where nothing can affect your happiness like that affirmation was telling us. Nothing can affect that because you're in joy. From joy, you were born. God made everything from his joy. Swami used to say that the nature of God is bliss. And bliss's nature is to share. So we were created out of that supreme bliss and desire to share. Value this life. Cherish this opportunity. And what is the goal? The goal is just love. The goal is to learn to love unconditionally. So make it, especially in this new year, make it your priority to love God and to love God in everyone and everything and see his light everywhere. <clears throat> those stories that Nirmala was telling about Swami Kriyananda reminded me of a couple of similar stories, related stories of his. And one of them is one that Nayaswami Jyotish has told sometimes that there was a time very, very early in the days of Ananda just beginning when Ananda Village didn't even exist yet and they were starting to build the meditation retreat, which is where Ananda began. That's about six miles away, up, up a fire access road. And while they were building, they built a temple. And, you know, it took multiple tries to get a building to stand up. I mean, it was, you know, it was a dome, but I mean, you know, they, they, tried, the, they tried the cheap way. Well, <coughs> that didn't work so well. That one blew down. They tried, you know, the next level up and that stood for a little while and then a windstorm came, you know, and it was draped all over the trees <laughs> in the neighborhood. Well, then they've got one to go and they got one to really stand up while it burned down in a fire. <laughs> and, and, you know, this, so this is the third try and, and they were camped out there. There were no other buildings. They were all just camping on the site there. And it was evening. Jyotish was sort of giving Swamiji a little bit of space. You know, he was maybe 30 to 50 feet away where his little bedroll was rolled out. And Swamiji was meditating. He could, su he could see that in the, in the moonlight. And he, he could hear something a little bit, like Swamiji was praying out loud, which is a little unusual. And he thought, oh, well, he's, he must be very disappointed. He must be very sad, you know, obviously. I mean, this is a big loss. And then he listened very closely. And what he heard Swamiji saying was, joy, ah, joy. And he just, he was stunned. And, and they had... Um, traveled down the road to do some shopping earlier in the day and the news had gotten around the neighborhood that the temple had burned down and, you know, people were aware of this um, happening. And Swamiji was in the store himself and he was chanting, singing, humming, you know, chanting a little bit in, the, in his mind and out loud too. And the woman in the store sort of confronted him a little bit and said, you're singing. But I mean, I heard you just lost this temple. And Swamiji said, well, I lost a temple. I didn't lose my voice. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was just such an instinctive response for him. There was another time where, also, again, in the early days, a little later though, there was <laughs> a lot more built up at this point, but Swamiji and a group of people were driving up to go skiing at Lake Tahoe from Ananda Village. And 
for those of you who know the geography, it's up Highway 20 to get to 80, and then you go over Donner Pass and, you know, find all sorts of ski areas past there. Well, Highway 20 can be pretty treacherous by itself, let alone Highway 80. I mean, there's, there can be chain control. They can even close Highway 20 when it's really snowing. Well, it was, it was snowy, but it wasn't snowing, but it was icy. And they came and, and nobody had noticed that the tires on Swamiji's car um, were pretty bald. You know, I think this, w this might have been one of the $75 cars that was bought at an auction, you know, back in the day. Anyway, they got their full dollar value out of this car. Anyway, they hit this patch of ice and the car started to spin and somebody in the back seat hollered out, Swami, you know, like he was supposed to do something about this right then. Well, the car spun around and smashed into a bus, which was there along the side of the road. And as soon as it came to a stop, Swamiji turned and said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, while he was in the moment, he was going to do whatever he could to deal with it. Afterwards, it's like, now I will take questions. Now I will <laughs> respond. But, you know, it's, I mean, to be poised in the moment is to be present fully. Doesn't mean you take extraneous questions when they're not relevant. I mean, it's, you know, deal with what you can deal with at the time. Well, it turned out the bus was going to the ski area that they wanted to go to to ski. So they just climbed in the bus. The car was totaled. It was like, we can't do anything about the car, but let's go skiing. We were going to go skiing anyway. Let's do it. And... That's the spirit that says, whatever it is, I'm going to turn. You know, I don't know if any of you ever had a cat and tried to see if you could drop the cat upside down and the cat always finds a way to land on its feet. I don't recommend this. This is <coughs> childhood experimentation, <laughs> shall we say. But you know, to be able to do that, to be flexible enough to land on your feet, to have that spirit of joy, as Nirmala was mentioning, the spirit of giving. Um, just another few little stories about Swamiji uh, and about that home in India because we were intimately involved in it. We lived in it with him. And we, when we landed up in India, we rented a, a big house. I mean, when I say these specifications, Americans just, so their eyes get big. The house had eight bedrooms, eight bathrooms and a huge basement. And the basement, in a way, might have been the, the clincher for us because, you know, you think of basements as kind of, you know, you, you play ping pong and the ball hits the ceiling because, you know, it's, you sort of have to duck a little to get under. Well, this ceiling had like a, I mean, this basement had like a 12 or 13 foot ceiling. I mean, it was, it was high, it was big. Anyway, we outgrew that house within three months. We had people living under the stairs. We had people crammed in every, you know, little cubby hole we could figure out. Okay, so we moved down the street. Well, Swamiji had bought furniture for his little apartment on the third floor. He had a little one-bedroom apartment with a tiny little living room. And what, was, what would we do with the furniture? Well, he left it in the apartment for the next person who was going to live there. And the house that we moved into we furnished again with fresh furniture that matched that configuration. And when it came time to leave that rented house for a house that we bought, which was an yet another block away, again, that furniture stayed with the house. Why? Because a bunch of monks moved into it and they, nobody had any money. So, I mean, it was like, well, I'm not gonna, you know, leave a bare house for them. So the new house got furnished yet another time. And he just had this way of, you know, every time a new smartphone would come out, somebody would want to buy him the new smartphone. Well, somebody else would say, Swamiji, I'll buy your old one. And he would go, well, I'm not a merchant. I'm not going to sell you my old smartphone. Here, take it. And, you know, you can imagine that people would sort of queue up to <laughs> catch that moment. <laughs> it's like, let's, let's, let's try to ask the question at just the right moment. <laughs> but to have that ability to be flexible enough in the moment, I mean, and, and you know, these are all 
sort of, you can say the, the easier side of, of things, although people get very attached to their possessions, as you might imagine. You know, they get attached to their attachments. And Swamiji could face disaster as well. He could face great loss. I mean, that loss of the temple was substantial. I mean, those things shake you. You know, it's not, it's not easy to face that sort of thing. And personal loss, again, it's, it's significant. It's real. It's not something that we sort of dismiss. I mean, I remember reading and hearing that Yogananda, when he did the funeral for Sister Gyanamata, his most advanced woman disciples, tears were rolling down his cheeks. I tried to ask Swamiji about that one time and he wouldn't talk about it. You know, he was present for that funeral, but he wouldn't go there. You know, it was too sacred. It was too, I mean, and Master himself is talking. He's talking to God in public and he's saying, I know the truth that she is free. I know that, but my human heart misses this soul. You know, we feel that loss. We're human beings. I mean, he was a master, but he was a person too. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a spectrum of reality. We have to deal with it. But that commitment, it's interesting, this affirmation, the, the choice to be happy, a determination to be happy under all circumstances. That word be is italicized. And if you think about that, it's like a commitment. It's like saying, I know, and the affirmation itself, I am joy, to keep affirming that, even in the face of all the ups and downs that come to us, because happiness is like a reflection of joy. You know, you can, you can almost think of a spectrum. Pleasure is a pleasant sensation, the, uh, rather the opposite of the rotten rice that Nirmala was, in the story Nirmala was telling. You know, the really yummy dessert or whatever it is that pleases our senses in one way or another. Happiness is higher up on the scale, but happiness has this way of being dependent on something. Well, the trouble is that when happiness is dependent on something, that something can go away. That something can be removed from us in, in one way or another. You know, we, we're thrilled to be able to run fast or to jump high or to be able to ski down a mountain and work our way through all the little moguls and bumps and fly off of them at will and land gracefully and so on. Well, those things can all be lost outwardly. You know, it's one of the reasons that in elder, in older age, people are, are often, they, there's this regret because people remember their youth. They remember the, the healthy vitality. Uh, I have a, a nephew who's a runner, a, a, an ultra marathoner, not just marathoner, but like the 50 mile style and the, and the 100 mile bike ride on gravel, <laughs> on gravel roads. <laughs> it's like, why would you ride on gravel? That's where the race is, you know? <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, if you go riding through mountains on gravel, well, that's what the... But anyway, he has a girlfriend who's very nicely suited to him in this regard because she got it in her mind that she, what she wanted to do, what would make her happy <laughs> was to run there's a, there's a thing in the Grand Canyon where you can go rim to rim, which means usually it's done north rim to south rim. And it's 23 and a half miles of down, across, and up. And it is a long way down. It is like 6,000 feet down, which, you know, may sound really easy, like, yeah, you know, you just go downhill. Yeah, well, guess what? <laughs> I did that, and it's really hard. After about four hours of going downhill, your, your legs feel like noodles. I mean, it's just like, what? I, my dad wanted me to, he would just bugged me for years. I want you to, you got to do this. You got to do this. I said, Dad, I will do it. 
but I will not do it in one day. I am not going to, tor- he would just do it in one day. He was like, Dad, I'm not going to torture myself. I want to enjoy this hike if I'm going to do it. We will stay at the bottom at the campground, which takes like years in advance to reserve it, which we finally did. We stayed at the bottom. Then you hike up the next day, 5,000 feet up on the other side. And it truly was magnificent. It was incredible. Well, anyway, back to my nephew's girlfriend. So what would make her happy was there are people who do rim to rim to rim in one go. And some of them do it in 12 hours, which is just, a, you know, it's 46 miles and it's, you're either generally either going up or down. I mean, it's brutal. Well, apparently she did it, you know, and, and not only did it, but, you know, like drove to the site in one pass from Montana down to the Grand Canyon, did the thing, climbed back in the car and got back by the end of the weekend to go to work on Monday. Or, you know, what? I mean, the kind of stuff that when you're nuts enough as a youth, you just do it and it's like, yeah, this is going to be really great. This is going to be really fun. Anyway, <clears throat> in, as the decades amount, as they pile up, we may remember those things with some regret as the ability no longer exists or even the predilection <laughs> no longer <laughs> exists. Why on earth did I do that or why would anybody do that? But yet, we can lose that sense of inner joy if, if, we're, can, if we're still tied to the outward side of our lives. Oh, it's my home or oh, it's this or that or the other thing. And you know, you think, if you look on the news, inevitably there is some disaster somewhere. It's always being reported. Whatever the disaster is, it is in the news. There's a flood here. Oh, there's a terrible fire there. Oh my God, the tornado, the hurricane, the, you know, this, that, the other thing. It's all, you know, they're freezing temperatures. Oh my God, the electric cars didn't charge. You know, it's like, it's all there in the news. Why? Because people just get really attached to well, I was determined to go so-and-so, and and, oh, I didn't realize you have to charge the car more times when it's cold. It's just God is still present in the middle of all the ignorance. But if we think of our own history, how many times have I tried to do something that, you know, I just, well, I'll just give you an example. My first all-day meditation, eight-hour meditation, Christmas meditation, This is 1979, December 23rd, probably 1979. Well, I had it in my mind that if you really want to have a wonderful all-day meditation, you fast, okay? As it happens, I do that even now, and it works out pretty good. But at the time, I didn't know that there were other implications. And then the second thing I thought was, okay, well, I'll walk the five miles to get to the meditation in the freezing cold because it was snowing. And then I didn't also realize that Swamiji liked to have the windows open in the temple. <laughs> and so I'm along the side because I didn't want to be right in the middle of the action. <sighs> and if you're fasting, you get cold. Like you get cold like in your bones, you know, it's like your body temperature. Anyway, and I tried sitting on the floor the whole time. It was, it was a, let's just say it was a challenging meditation. <laughs> That's called ignorance because I didn't know, you know, moderation as a concept didn't really occur to the 19-year-old spirit, shall we say. Well, all of us are 19 or all of us are little kids in one way or another because we're growing into understanding, we're growing into wisdom. God is still present even in the ignorant places. But let's look for the light because when the light illuminates that, then you just go, oh my God, that's just not such a good idea. What do you say we just don't do that? And you learn. It's like there's a flow to it. But know that that grace, that blessing is there. And I'm going to digress here for a moment. My talk is basically over, but I'm going to talk personally for a moment here because... My happiness in the last 24 hours has been challenged 
by a loss. And the loss is that Steve Hagee passed away yesterday. And it was sudden, it was unexpected, it was heart failure and other circumstances. We're, we're learning this from his wife who, you know, Russian is her first language. She's not necessarily understanding the doctors completely and, you know, we're trying to get more details. But anyway, I want to just have us stand and send our love and our blessings to his soul, to his family, who are obviously challenged by this, but also just to feel that God's light is present here and now in the circumstance and that on a human level, we miss him. I miss him, you know, he was behind the camera last week, I think, and, you know, sang in the choir, etc. These things come unexpectedly sometimes, but let's send our love and light. There's a, we'll do an astral ascension ceremony at some point relatively soon. I don't know exactly when. We haven't gotten that far. But just for the moment, let's send our love and light to his soul and blessings. Let's rub our hands together. Chant Om, send out waves of light and joy. Oh.